must have been Wednesday or Thursday of this past week. I thought I was going to die. It was so hot. <laughs> now, I'm very clear about who I am. I am a northerner by birth and by pedigree, coming straight from that great city, New York, New York, so great, I've been told that they had to name the city twice. I'm new to this region, this great state of North Carolina, and as I walked across campus this past week, it was so hot. Rays of the sun were beating upon my brow with such fierce intensity that I just thought that I might not make it. It's hot in North Carolina. And as I reached for my water bottle on that day, I could not help but to conjure the poetic sensibilities of one Langston Hughes, who, amidst the heat of the movement for black freedom, penned I've known rivers, ancient, dusky rivers. I sipped my water and I remembered that it was Hughes who said I bathed in the Euphrates and I built my hut on the Congo. I looked upon the Nile. I heard the singing of the Mississippi. I've known rivers. Now I don't know much about the Euphrates or the Congo. I only had to walk from Chapel Drive to Campus Drive. But even still, it was so hot that day, I did not know if I was going to make it. And you know, you know exactly what I'm talking about today. Maybe you were not caught on campus in the sun last week, but someone here knows what it feels like when life begins to, to heat up. For it seems sometimes that you in one moment are in the frying pan, and then in the next moment, you are in the fire. Someone may be breaking a sweat right now, thinking about what you went through last week, what you went through last month, what you've been through in the past year. When you received that dreaded call, perhaps informing you that there is not much time left. And though we have all heard it said, when the earthly house of this tabernacle be dissolved, We've got a building, a house, not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. The grief that we've been carrying for years has scorched our faith. And perhaps someone does not know how you will make it. Someone is breaking a sweat right now thinking about what you may have to walk into next week. Maybe it's tension on the job, or perhaps trouble in your household, or perhaps a hard conversation among friends. And although the words of Jesus echo in our heart, lo, I will be with you. Even until the end of the age, anxiety singes our faith, and we don't know how we're going to make it, or perhaps we just have a lot to do. We're working, and we're studying, we're caring for children and caring for parents. Some of us have to rob Peter to pay Paul. We run hither, thither, and yon, serving on this committee and on that board. And sure, we have heard it said, I can do all things through Christ, who strengthens me. But the truth is, we're burning up from exhaustion. And we just don't know how much longer we'll make it. Believe it or not, this is where we find Hagar in our text today. Hagar thought she was going to die. She and her son, Ishmael, that they would not make it out of the wilderness. Now a patriarch and a misogynistic gaze typically reads Genesis 21 as the story of Abraham and his faith. But today we find in this text, 
The story of Hagar, an African slave woman. Womanist theologian Dolores S. Williams would call her a sister in the wilderness. She did not know how she was going to make it. And in case we missed it in the text, Hagar was not Abraham's lover. She was not Abraham's wife. Hagar was not Sarah's best girlfriend, nor was she Sarah's maid. Hagar was a slave. And the text tells us and is confirmed by our understanding of slavocracy that as a slave woman, Hagar was caught in the intersection of social biases, namely gender bias and racial ethnic bias. Hagar, like Sarah, was subject to Abraham because she was a woman. But at the same time, she is subject to Abraham and Sarah because of her racial, ethnic, and economic designation as an Egyptian slave woman. She is poor. Yes, Hagar is poor and Hagar is black, yes. And Hagar is unlettered and it is based on this social location as slave woman. Uh, and Ishmael's social location as a descendant of a slave. That the story begins to heat up. Hugh says, I uh, known rivers, uh, ancient dusky rivers. Sarah says, cast this slave woman out with her son. Abraham, he didn't want to do it. He did not want to cast Ishmael out. The text tells us that Abraham was distressed on account of his son, but he did it anyway. We've all found ourselves in situations where we knew that we should have gone right, but we went left instead. Situations where we should have gone up, but we went down instead. Situations where we should have said no, but we said yes instead. Yes to the money and yes to the power and yes to the fame. And even the great apostle has told us for the good I would do. I do not. But the evil that I would not do, that is what I do. Abraham, he knew he was wrong. The Bible says that he was distressed, but he cast Hagar and Ishmael out anyway. And the fact of the matter this morning, sisters and brothers, is that sometimes even God's people are wrong. Dead wrong. Especially when it comes to matters of racial justice. Especially when it comes to matters of gender justice, especially when it comes to matters of economic justice and the intersections thereof. Sure, we come into the church singing, it is well with my soul. We even go out singing, guide me, oh, thou great Jehovah pilgrim in this barren land in the black church tradition. We sing, lead me. Guide me along the way, for if you lead me, I will not stray. Lord, let me walk each day with thee. Lead me, O oh Lord, lead me. But as soon as we move out of the solace of the church walls, we do an about face. And we desert the justice, the mercy, the humility that the God of Amos calls us toward sometimes the people of God, yes, those who are called by God's names, yes, uh, those who uh, are given the promise, yes, those who recite the scripture, fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass, even the people of God sometimes are just wrong. Some will say, but God told Abraham to cast them out. God said, Abraham, do not be distressed. Do whatever Sarah tells you to do. And this, my friends, is a fair reading. But 
the Word of God, as revealed in the New Testament reading this morning, also tells us that God has numbered the hairs on our head. The gospel tells us that God uh, knew us before we were formed in our mother's womb. There is a song that says Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done in so far as we serve an omniscient God. A God who knows our going out and our coming in. Uh, God knew what Abraham uh, was going to do before Abraham had the opportunity to do it. And God had a contingency plan in place. I've heard it said like this, what man means for evil, God means for good. The psalmist would say, he prepares a, a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. The prophet Isaiah would say, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. God can take our absolute worst and turn it into God's best. No matter how you slice it, Abraham was wrong. Abraham was a slaver. Cast this slave woman out. But God had a plan. Even David, oh, David, was a rapist. Create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. But God had a plan. The widow at Zarephath was down to her last. I have not cake but a handful of meal. But God had a plan. Esther was scared for her life. I will go to the king even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. But God had a plan. Mary came up out of the ghetto. What good can come out of Nazareth? But God had a plan. Blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. Jesus was born in a barn and died a slave on a cross on a hill. Far away stood an old rugged cross, but God had a plan, the emblem of suffering and shame. But I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. And what is God's plan, you say? Huh? that the lamb shall lay down with the lion. What is God's plan, you say, uh, that we shall beat our swords into plowshares and study war no more? What is God's plan that the borrower shall become the lender, that the first shall become last, that the last shall be first. What is God's plan that every valley shall be exalted and, and every mountain shall be made low, that the crooked places shall be made straight and the rough places made plain. God can take our worst and turn it into God's best. So Abraham, he cast Hagar and Ishmael out into the wilderness. In some translations, the text says that they were cast into the desert. You know it's hot in the desert. And Abraham put bread and a skin of water on her shoulder and sent her away. So not only has Hagar been cast out based on her social location as an African slave woman who had been coerced into surrogacy by Sarah's scheming ways at the hands of the man of God. But she had secondarily been weighed down by being forced to carry what Abraham had placed on her shoulders. Some of us, some of us are in the habit of making other people carry our stuff. And others of us are in the habit of allowing folks to unload on us. Zora Neale Hurston, that great giant of the Harlem Renaissance, characterized black women as the mules of the world, always subject to carrying someone else's load, cleaning someone else's kitchen, scrubbing someone else's floors, caring for someone else's children, cooking 
someone else's food, and here comes Hagar, carrying what Abraham had given her, until she finds out for herself that what she had been given was insufficient for her journey. Sometimes we have to recognize that other people's stuff is not ours to carry. Other people's prayers might take us part of the way. The song sings, my mother prayed for me, had me on her mind, took a little time and prayed for me. My father prayed for me, the preacher prayed for me, the deacon prayed for me. Other people's prayers might take us part of the way. Uh, but if we want to make it all the way, we're going to have to learn to pray for ourselves. Other people's hopes and dreams might take us part of the way. But unless we hope and dream for ourselves, we will not make it all the way Hagar had lived her life carrying other people's things and had no thing of her own. So here we find her weeping in the wilderness. She and her child cast out because she is poor, because she is a woman, because she is a poor woman of African descent. The cool air in this chapel might make it easy to sit back and, and consider Hagar, to imagine her life in the heat of the day. It may allow us to forget that it is hot in North Carolina too, that there are women and men and children right here in Durham who like Hagar and Ishmael because of social indicators, because they are poor, because they are colored, because they are women or sexual minorities have been cast out and weighed down by our isms, by our phobias. And they are crying Hagar's tears because they don't know if they will make it. Hagar put her child down and lifted up her voice and wept. But in verse 17, we're told that God did not hear her cry. Perhaps, perhaps you have cried Hagar's tears. Perhaps even on this day, you are crying Hagar's tears. Maybe it's you who have been cast out. Maybe it's you who are weighed down from what you've been carrying for 10 and 20 and 25 years. Maybe you are crying Hagar's tears because your family and your friends have turned their backs on you. Or maybe you're crying because you went left when you should have gone right. The heat of life's wilderness has got you crying Hagar's tears. You've been praying over and over again, but it seems like God does not hear you. And you don't know if you will make it. But the psalmist told us that though weeping endures for a night, joy comes in the morning. Isaiah informed us that unto them who mourn in Zion, God gives beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Hagar cried, and God did not hear her. Womanist theology would suggest that God is partial and discriminating. Don't believe me, ask the Canaanites or the First Nations. God did not hear her. But the text says that God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. God showed her, though God did not hear her. 
God showed her where the water was. I am the living water that never runs dry. So the next time you find life heating up on you, the next time you find yourself in life's desert, the sun scorching you, the heat suffocating you, and you don't know if you will make it, remember that Hughes told us that even the Negro speaks of rivers. I've known rivers. My soul has grown deep like rivers, but Hagar, Hagar reminds us that in the desert, it is only God who shows us where the water is. My foremothers, those African slave women who toiled with their children in the heat of the southern day would have said it like this, weighed children in the water. God is going to trouble the water. It was hot last week, and I did not know if I was going to make it, but I reached for my water and wiped the sweat from my brow, and I kept on walking. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen.